<laughs> Johnny Dollar. Johnny, listen. I've just looked up the plane schedule. Ah. Yes. Now listen. If you hop into your car and drive on out to Bradley Field, you can just make the point to New York. It'll New get York? Just... At this ungodly hour? Listen, will you? It'll get you there just in time to catch the morning 707 out here to the coast. Oh, 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 oh. Hold everything, will you? Get going, will you, Johnny, while this thing is still hot? Wait a minute, wait a minute, I tell you. Who are you? What's this all about? Oh, I'm sorry. This is Art, Art Bascom, Western Life and Trust Insurance here in Los Angeles. Arthur, in the middle of the night... It's morning. And, Johnny, you've got to make that jet flight out of New York. Leaves here at 8.45. Why do I? Because this may be a case of murder. Yeah, what may be a case of murder? Johnny... Make some sense, will you? Hurry up or you'll miss that plane. Art. Hello. Okay, here we go again. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. To the Western Life and Trust Insurance Company, Los Angeles office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the fatal switch matter. Expense account item one, eight bucks for the flight to New York. Item two, 176.25, the jet flight to Los Angeles. It was shortly after 11 a.m. Pacific time when Art Bascom met me at the L.A. International Airport. We took off in his car and headed south. Balboa, Johnny. It's about 50 miles down the coast. Very successful. Based on Free Baron's exclusive rights to the patent on a radio control device. Sitting rights, that is. Uh-huh. Big government order, that sort of thing. Yeah, I see. All right, now tell me what's happened. Well... Free Baron's uh, partner, so to speak, is the man who invented this device, who owns the patent. A young bachelor by the name of uh, Edgar Porter. And? Johnny, it seems that Porter took the cruiser out for a trip yesterday morning. Yeah. Well, last evening, Mr. Free Baron thought he'd call him by radio. You know, just to find out where he was, make sure he was all right. Uh-huh. Couldn't raise him? No, he contacted him without any trouble. But then, in the middle of their conversation, suddenly... Well, Johnny, from what Porter said, his last words over the radio... Yeah? Well, it looks as though somebody killed him. Where's the cruiser now, Art? Somewhere out in the Pacific. The Coast Guard's trying to find it. Well, then he hadn't given Free Baron his position. No. I guess he didn't have time before whatever it was killed him. Uh Uh-huh. Who else was on board the boat with this man, Porter? That's the first thing I asked Mr. Free Baron when he phoned me. Well? No one. Huh? Not even any other boats around. Porter and that cruiser were out there alone. Yet, judging by what he said, someone somehow managed to kill him. Who, what? Who said? Porter himself. Well, how do you know what he said? Lester Freebaron told me. He and his wife were talking with Porter by radio when it happened. Oh, well, then you only have his word for what Porter may have said. Also, Johnny, Freebaron was making a tape recording of their conversation. Oh, I wonder why. I don't know. But he told me over the phone that he has that recording. And you're sure that Porter was alone out there? That's what he told Free Baron, but if he was murdered... I know, I know. It doesn't make sense. Brother, it sure doesn't. Let's get on down there to Balboa. The Free Baron home on Newport Bay was small compared to some of those around it, but nice nevertheless. A speedboat was tied up at the dock, but there was no sign of the cruiser. Lester Free Baron was a man of 57 or 8, I'd say, but right now he looked a lot older than it. His wife, considerably younger, was quite a dish. A tall, statuesque redhead. She wore an expensive silk house coat with an ermine collar. A real careful makeup job, too. Her eyes especially were, uh... Well, let's say she knew how to use them. And Art Bascom had said that Edgar Porter was a young bachelor. Hmm. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, uh, Marilyn, will you bring me another cup of coffee? Why, of course, uh, Johnny. Perhaps Mr. Dollar and Mr. Baskin would like a drink. Uh, no, thanks. You can pass me. No, thanks, Mr. Peter. Excuse me, gentlemen. I uh, just talked to the Coast Guard again. 
We've got planes and boats, even a helicopter out there looking for the less one, the cruiser. No sign of her. Mr. Freebaron, Art tells me you're uh, certain that your partner, Edgar Porter, was alone out there on that yacht. Because he told me that he was. Now, let me play the tape recording of our brief radio conversation with him. By all means. Just uh, give this thing a few seconds to warm up. How'd you uh, happen to record your conversation with him? I just made some modifications in this machine, and I thought I'd check it out. I'm so glad now I did. Oh. Now, that's a make I don't think I've ever seen before. Oh, I made it myself, Dollar. Like this receiver here, the transmitter. Make all these things myself. That's the reason I'm in the business I am. And it's a lot better than that old chemical plant he started out with. Here you are, darling. Thank you, my dear. Now, uh, let's start the tape. You'll hear both our voices on uh, on it, uh, Mr. Dollar. Listen. Lester, you would spoil my little trip by calling me up this way. Just wanted to see how you're doing, boy. Is everything okay? Okay. It's great. I'm having myself a ball out here. Hello, Edgar. Hi, Marilyn. What's your position, Ed? Oh, 50, 60 miles out. And believe me, it's great to be away from people and things, Regine. You're all alone. Nobody within miles. Oh, you're sure of that? Well, of course I am. Not even a girlfriend alone? Nah, you know better than that, Marilyn. Nope, there isn't even another boat in sight. Hey, it's kind of chilly out here. Edgar, put on the cabin heater, the gas heater. I put it on just a minute ago. Good. Only, Ed... Be sure the ceiling vent is wide open. Oh, yes, Edgar. Be careful. Now, now, don't worry. I know this old tub just... Just a... What? No. No. You wouldn't do it. Good, good heavens, man. You can't do this to... No. Edgar. Hello. Johnny. That was a pistol shot. Yeah, that's uh, all there was to the recording? That's all, Dollar. We kept trying to call him back, but got no answer. But he said he was... He was certain he was all alone. Yes. Well, Dollar? Impossible, huh? Impossible. Except for one thing. Yes? The fact it happened. Mr. Freebarn, there isn't much we can do until the Coast Guard locates that cruiser of yours. They've promised to call the minute they do. Johnny. Yes, Mrs. Freebarn. Oh, it's Marilyn. You don't mind. Oh, sure. No, I don't mind. Well? Edgar said he'd already put on the gas heater there in the cabin. Why, yes. And the cabin on the Leslin is rather small. Carbon monoxide would build up in a matter of minutes. Yeah, but he said he'd just turned it on. Nevertheless. He also said he knew that boat as well as you do, which means he'd have to be careful of that heater. Well, we all get careless now and then. Also, his last words. Uh, good heavens, man, you can't do this. Now, who's the man he was talking to? It doesn't make sense, Johnny, because he swore he was alone out there. Yeah, but was he? Oh, Edgar was so painfully honest, even about little things. If he said he was alone, he was. Or at least he believed that he was. Well, if somebody had come out of some hiding place to threaten him, wouldn't he have identified him by name, at least for your benefit? Hiding place? Well, don't forget, he knew that you were hearing every word he said. Yes, of course. But as for anyone hiding there on the boat, no, it's impossible. Edgar was too meticulous. He would have checked over every inch of that cruiser before setting out. Now, you're sure of that, huh? Oh, when we'd all planned to go out together, it used to drive us to near distraction, having to wait for Edgar to inspect every line, every locker, even the engine box, every nook and cranny. Could somebody have got aboard after he left the harbor? Without his knowing it? No, never. What about that shot, just as he was cut off? I wonder. Uh, you know about radio equipment, Mr. Freebairn? And I know what you're thinking, Dollar. Yes, it's quite possible that was simply some connection breaking when he fell against the transmitter. Or it may have been a shot. By whom? Uh, suicide? Edgar? Oh, never, Johnny. You sound pretty sure of that. Oh, I agree with the dollar. Edgar had too much to live for. His invention was about to make him millions, thanks to what I've been able to do with it. Well, then this radio control device will do all right by you, too, won't it? Of course it will. Now, just...
just a minute. What do you mean to imply by that? Incidentally, I... Yes, John. Just what's the insurance angle on this thing? Oh, I thought you understood. There's a partnership policy between Edgar and Mr. Freeburn. Survivor of the two becomes the beneficiary? Yes. For good heavens, do you think money would ever compensate for the loss of a man, a friend like Edgar? Uh, what's the face value? $225,000. Well, no, dollars. Hey, tell me, if Edgar is dead, Mr. Freebaron, do all rights to this patent revert to you? Yes. After all, I'm the one who... Now, look here, young man. Yes, John. Well, just uh, take it easy now. Oh, and there's one thing I forgot to ask you. Well? How did you get to know Ed Porter? There's no secret about it. Merrill met him at some yacht club affair, persuaded him to bring the radio control to me. Oh, oh. Oh, and there's another thing I forgot to ask. Yes, what's that? Who is your contact over at the Coast Guard? A man by the name of Adam Patrick. Huh? Pat? Why do you say it that way, Johnny? Well, he's an old friend of mine. Gave me a hand when I was out here on the Ellen Deer matter. Ellen Deer? Yeah, the name of a big yacht that was being used for smuggling stuff up from Mexico, narcotics and stuff. Well, certainly you don't think our cruiser was being used for... I don't see the connection. All right, let me use your car. Of course, Johnny. Here. Here are the keys. Good, Thanks. Where are you going? Well, instead of waiting for Pat to call here, I think I'll run over and see him. I think you're right, Dollar. Why don't we all go on over there? We can get any news of the Leslin and Edgar firsthand. No, thanks. I'll go along. Yeah. May I ask why? Because I've suddenly got me a handful of ideas about this whole affair. Oh, Johnny. Like what? Um, I never was very good at mathematics. Mathematics? If I can get there first... Well, maybe I can add two and two together and somehow come up with five. What? That is, if Edgar Porter was murdered. John Oakos got reporters, followed by old pal Adam Patrick, was just about to take off in a cutter. Okay, boys, cast off and let's get underway. Hey, sir. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Johnny. Hold on anything, will you? Oh, hey, sir. Here I come. Johnny Dollar. What do you think you are? Superman? Yeah. Hey, Pat, I, uh, I hope you're heading out to the Pleasant. Why, yes. One of our cops has spotted her a few miles out. You think you're working on this one, too? Yeah. Kind of a thick one, isn't it? Sure it is. Now, a man completely alone out there could be murdered. There couldn't possibly have been anyone with him. Mm. At least with old man uh, Freeburn has been telling me the truth. Oh, I think he has, Pat. At least as far as he's gone. What do you mean by that? Well, does he know you've located the lesson? Sure. When I got word, I phoned him, then grabbed Dr. Wilson. See him up for there. Hey, wait a minute. You gave Freeburn the position of the lesson? Sure, why not? Hey, listen, can you get a few more knots out of this barge? We're up on top right now. What do you mean, Johnny? How much do you know about Lester Freeburn and his wife? Oh, man, that Marilyn. Huh? The greatest business asset a promoter like Freeburn could possibly have. Oh, yeah. How else do you think he got his paws on that radio control he makes? Yeah, yeah, I know about her, uh, connections. Why not? Why shouldn't she? It's that kind of monkey science that keeps her in furs and expensive cars and everything else she likes. Yeah, I see. And then the Freeburns are, uh, quite a team, huh? Understatement of the week. And I understand he does pretty well for himself. Look, when that government contract gets rolling, and if his partner's dead, well, man, he's, he's back in the black so fast. Oh, you think he's in the red now? Look, after all that dough he spent on that plant, Johnny. Uh, a couple of hundred thousand might come in handy, huh? Even a grand or two. What are you getting at? Let's uh, get on out to the Leslin, huh? It took us something under an hour to reach the Leslin, where she drifted around on the calm sea untended. Had her engines running, she might have got halfway across the Pacific before we found While the crew of the cutter were preparing to tow her into harbor, Pat on a doctor and I, and we climbed aboard, and I took a good, careful look around, and believe me, I found plenty. Edgar Porter was dead, all right. His body slumped over the radio set. Carbon monoxide, the doctor said. Please, that's what my preliminary examination shows, Mr. Dollar. But then, before we could get her underway, sure enough, Lester Freebaron rolled up in his speedboat. He came aboard, joined us in the cabin... Took a look at the body of Edgar Porter and then. Then it was carbon monoxide poisoning. And I told him by radio to be sure that this. This vent was open. 
Too late, Mr. Freeburn. What, Mr. Dollar? Well, that fast little boat of yours didn't get you here soon enough. That vent was wide open. Yeah, the first thing I looked at. Well, then I don't understand. If it was carbon monoxide poisoning... Yes, John. Oh, sure, sure, sure it was. But not from this gas heater. You mean maybe some leak in the exhaust system? Not even that would have done it, Pat. This cabin door was wide open when we came aboard. Well, even so... Alive, Edgar was pretty valuable to you, Mr. Freeburn. Of course. As my partner with his invention... And your wife, with an eye for the dollar sign, roped him in very nicely for you. I guess he really had a case on her. I utterly failed to see... But Edgar dead would be even better, you thought. Oh, now look No here. more need to share the profits on his invention. Are you trying to say I thought of killing him? This radio transmitter and receiver, some of your work? Of course. But before getting into electronics, you were a chemist, weren't you? So you'd know even better than I do how carbon monoxide can be produced from a little crystal of some kind. I forgot the name of it. But when it gets thoroughly heated... Now, look here, Dollar. Edgar was alone on this boat. Now, you look. The cord on his microphone is very short. So? He had to lean over the transmitter when he talked to you by radio. So what? That's one of the reasons you knew he fell against Spinetta when he keeled over. You mentioned it when you played back that tape for us. Well, I simply... Assumed... You knew he did. Even as you knew his head would be right over this grill work on top of the transmitter when he used the mic. Look through the grill, pipe. Yeah, Johnny. All right, that little coil on the back of the panel where nobody noticed it. Yeah? A heating element that was turned on when the mic was turned on. See? Hey, hey you see? It's starting to glow like a small coil on one of those electric heaters. And believe me, it had nothing to do with transmitting a signal. Dollar. Instead, it was used to heat up a crystal of that chemical I mentioned to produce a deadly concentrated dose of carbon monoxide. Johnny. Sure. Take a good look at that coil, and I'm sure you'll find traces of the chemical on it. Get the picture, Pat? Yeah. Yeah, Johnny, I sure do. All he had to do was stay right there in his home and put in a call to Porter on the radio. That's right. To answer him, Porter turned on this transmitter. When he leaned over to use the mic, that meant he was right on top of the coil with a chemical on it. The coil that was heating up, producing the gas that killed yeah. him. Oh, all that dirty, diabolical. Yeah. Well, Mr. Freeburn. <laughs> Mr. Freebaron had suddenly run out of answers. And I'm willing to bet that the best lawyer in the country can't get him out of this one. Best of all, of course, he won't collect a penny of the insurance on the partner that he murdered him. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, and the plane fare back to Hartford, three eighty six twenty one, And then cheap at half the price. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's program. Next week, well, one of the most clever, most ingenious crimes I've ever run into during my career as a special investigator. Motive and method are all too obvious. So are all the clues needed to solve the crime. Yet, a simple little device we're all familiar with is used to cover them up and apparently make them meaningless. Yeah, I'm talking about a device that we all use every day. There's probably one of them right there in that room with you, right beside you waiting for you to pick it up and use it. Just be sure that you don't use it to cover up a murder. Instead, well, be sure to join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Olin Soule, Sam Edwards, Will Wright, and Herschel Bernard. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. You've been listening to the OTR Gold Network. Find more classic radio at otrgold.com.